Hi, and welcome to the Society of Skeletal Radiology's Resident Education Club Bite. My name is Dr. Pamela Walsh from Northwell Health in New York, and today's topic will be fluoroscopic guided hip joint injections. The plan for the next 10 minutes or so is to cover fluoroscopic guided hip injections from start to finish. We'll cover indications for the injection, pre-procedure planning, the procedure itself, and post-procedure follow-up. We'll also provide a couple of additional reading options. Hip injections can be performed for a variety of reasons with diagnostic and therapeutic indications. A frequent indication we see for hip injection is patients with known hip osteoarthritis who are referred for injections for pain relief. There are also scenarios where it's difficult to discern whether the patient's hip pain is due to extraarticular versus intraarticular pathologies, as well as whether the pain is hip versus back pain. So these fluoroscopic guided hip injections can provide diagnostic information as to whether the hip is the pain generator. And then another frequent indication for fluoroscopic guided hip injections is to instill intraarticular contrast into the hip for patients undergoing CT or MRI. Before starting the case, we want to make sure that the order for the procedure is appropriate and that the laterality is correct. Review any prior pertinent imaging the patient may have. It's also important to review the patient's medical history, medications, and allergies. Once you clear the patient for the procedure, detailed consent is performed. Then you can put on your protective lead apron and eyewear and get started. The patient is placed on the fluoroscopic table supine with the hip being injected closest to you. The foot is placed in slight internal rotation so that the femoral neck is well visualized. On the right, we have an example of if the patient foot is in external rotation, which results in a greater trochanter obscuring the femoral neck landmark. A sandbag or tape can be applied to assist the patient in keeping their foot in slight internal rotation if needed. Now that the patient is positioned appropriately and the hip is centered in the field of view on your fluoroscopic image, you can mark where we want to inject. There are two different approaches for the initial skin entry, but the desired landmark for the needle on the bone is the same along the lateral aspect of the femoral neck. It's also important to have an idea of where the femoral neurovascular bundle is, which can be done with direct palpation. The eye of the needle approach is one of two trajectories we can use when inserting the spinal needle onto the femoral neck. This technique entails marking the skin in the region of the superolateral aspect of the femoral neck, same as our bony landmark. The needle will be inserted and directed in a straight down fashion onto the superolateral femoral neck. With this technique, you'll ideally see the needle on FOSS as demonstrated here in the fluoroscopic image on the right. The oblique approach is another technique we can use for inserting the needle. This involves marking the superior aspect of the greater trochanter as our skin entry site. The needle will enter the skin at this level and will be directed in an oblique horizontal fashion medially to the bony landmark of the superolateral aspect of the femoral neck. With this technique, you will be able to see more of the physical needle as it courses towards the bony landmark as shown in the fluoroscopic image on the right. The needles required will include our subcutaneous anesthetic needle, which is frequently a 25 gauge or sometimes even smaller. A 22 gauge, three and a half inch spital needle is typically used for injecting into the hip joint. Something to consider is a longer needle may be required in some scenarios, such as body habitus. For the medications for the injection, these include lidocaine for the subcutaneous anesthetic, contrast to confirm intraarticular placement, and our injectate. The injectate varies depending on the type of exam, indication, as well as physician preference. For CT and MRI arthrograms, Iodine and gadolinium-based contrast agents are used respectively. If the patient is referred for a diagnostic or therapeutic injection, commonly an anesthetic and steroid are used. Sometimes the referrer may request to forego the steroid agent. A variety of types and combinations of contrast, anesthetics, and steroids can be used. This is at the preference of the physician performing the exam, and at times, the referrer may also have a preference. For this abbreviated lecture, we will not be discussing the different injectable agents in detail. It is important to discuss with your attending what agents will be used as well as the dosage prior to drawing up the medications. 
In addition to the medications and needles, we also have our gloves, sterile drape, antiseptic, as well as gauze and a band-aid in our setup for the procedure. After you've decided your approach and the area is marked, the medications are drawn up in a sterile fashion. The mark site is cleaned with antiseptic and prepped with a sterile drape. Before anesthetizing, take a fluoroscopic image with your anesthetic needle overlying the marked area to be sure that the alignment is still the same and nothing has moved during prep. Once confirmed, the subcutaneous anesthetic is injected at the marked site. Once the area is anesthetized, the spinal needle can be inserted at the same site. It is important to make sure that the area you're inserting the spinal needle is the same area that you numbed with the anesthetic. The spinal needle is then guided to the bony landmark of the superior lateral femoral neck. Use fluoroscopic guidance intermittently to check the position of the needle as you advance it. Adjustments may have to be made if you notice the needle is not along the expected trajectory. Here's an example on the right of an injection with an oblique approach. Notice the severe osteoarthritis on this fluoroscopic image. As you direct your needle to the superior lateral femoral neck, there will be a tactile difference when the needle encounters the hard bony surface compared with the soft tissues. Once the needle is on bone and fluoroscopic images have confirmed placement, the stylet can be removed and contrast can be injected. There should not be much resistance with injecting the contrast, and it should feel as if the contrast is flowing smoothly. If you notice it is difficult to inject the contrast, and you see on your fluoroscopic images that you're in the appropriate location, try putting the stylet back in and turning the needle. If it is persistently difficult to administer contrast, you may have to reposition the needle. Here are some examples of intraarticular contrast. Note the contrast flowing away from the needle and surrounding the femoral head neck junction of the hip. You can also notice contrast extending distally within the hip joint along the femoral neck. These are some additional examples of intraarticular contrast. The image on the left uses an eye the needle approach with contrast along the lower aspect of the femoral neck. The middle and right sided images Use an oblique approach with contrast also along the inferior aspect of the femoral neck. You can notice that the intraarticular contrast in the middle and right images compared with the left-sided image appears less smooth in contour and slightly irregular. This can be seen in the setting of synovitis of the hip joint, and this is actually a frequently encountered finding. This is an example of a contrast flow pattern along the iliopsoas myotendinous junction. Notice how the contrast courses in a linear craniocaudal orientation following the course of the iliopsoas muscle and tendon. If this is encountered, repositioning of the needle is required for intraarticular placement. Iliopsoas injections can be performed as therapeutic interventions when indicated under fluoroscopic or ultrasound guidance. It seems like the trend is for iliopsoas injections to be performed under ultrasound, which can also provide direct visualization of the close by femoral vasculature. Here are some examples of abnormal flow patterns of contrast where the contrast pulls at the tip of the needle. If you see this, it is highly unlikely that the needle is within the joint space. The needle may be embedded in the joint capsule or may be completely extraarticular to the joint, possibly within the adjacent musculature or soft tissues. Resistance may be felt when trying to inject contrast compared with intraarticular injections, raising your awareness that you may not be in the joint. This is an example of a rare and important contrast flow pattern, which is intravascular flow. Notice the network of vasculature surrounding the hip opacified with contrast. If subsequent fluoroscopic images are performed without contrast injection, this pattern will likely not persist due to blood flow and wash out of the contrast. It is imperative to recognize this pattern and to adjust the needle before the administration of anesthetic and steroid. Once intraarticular placement is confirmed with contrast, the contrast can be exchanged for the injectate. When you inject the solution, the contrast will dilute and dissipate as demonstrated with the top image showing the initial administration of contrast and the lower image demonstrating injection of the injectate solution 
with dilution of the contrast. Once the injection is complete, the needle is removed and a band-aid is applied. Once the procedure is complete and the patient is ready to exit the table, you want to make sure that the patient feels okay without any lightheadedness or dizziness. You also want to make sure that the patient has strength in their legs while standing and walking. You or a member from your team will follow up with the patient to ensure that they are doing well post-procedure. Here are some take-home points from this mini-lecture. The first is to do your pre-procedure assessment to make sure that the indication is correct, the laterality is correct, and to review the patient's chart prior to doing the exam. Also review any pertinent imaging. We learned today that there are two approaches to fluoroscopic guided hip injections, the oblique approach and the eye of the needle approach. And it's important to recognize your contrast flow patterns to make sure you're intraarticular and to feel for tactile resistance or loss of resistance when you're intraarticular. And then we know some techniques to troubleshoot. That could be putting the stylet back in, turning the needle, you should also know when you need to reposition your needle when you feel like you're not intraarticular or your contrast flow pattern is abnormal. Listed here are some additional reading options. And that is the end of this SSR Bite. Be sure to check out the SSR Resident Education Club where there are monthly interactive lectures and also check out some of the other bites on the SSR YouTube channel. Thank you very much.